Hello, hello all of my Facebook friends. I am thrilled to be back with you again for session three of Book Club. I trust that you are well and have had a glorious day thus far. And yes, we are going to dive back into the Word of God together again today. And we are going to fall more in love with our Jesus because at the end of the day, whenever we discuss God's word, that is the number one objective for us to come away loving Jesus more and more wholly devoted to serving him and bringing glory to his matchless name. So if you are tuning in, please let me know where you are joining from, where in the world are you in my home nation of South Africa, are you tuning in from the US or the UK or elsewhere, I would love to hear where you are joining me from. We have had a fantastic few sessions thus far, diving into my latest release, Why Christ Died. I have thoroughly enjoyed myself diving back into the text because the text is all about Jesus. At the end of the day, that is the sole, the sole center point of this book, Jesus Christ, his person, his death, and his resurrection. So tonight we are going to look at two chapters, which is not many chapters, considering that in the last two sessions we have gone through five each. But I wanted to focus on these two chapters with you in one session and only these two chapters because there are two pivotal chapters and I really want us to get our teeth into these chapters. And I know we are going to be incredibly blessed, both you and I. So people are joining in. Wonderful Celia from Standerton, most welcome Dalmain from Mitchell's Plain in Cape Town. Welcome, Dalmain. Mitch, lovely to see you, Mitch, from the USA. Welcome, welcome. Let us pray, and then we are going to get going as everybody else jumps on board. Precious Jesus, thank you that we can come together again to learn more about you. We are desperate to know you in all of your wonderful fullness. We are desperate to fully understand what you achieved for us through your death and resurrection. Help us, Lord. We know that what we are going to dive into now over the next hour, these are truths that we struggle to fathom with our earthly minds, but help us. Help us to grasp these truths with our minds so that we may, we may appreciate what you did for us even more and so that we can better share what you did with others who do not yet know you, Lord. So please, Holy Spirit, help us to understand. Let this time that we spend together be special, be precious. Please, Spirit, of our God. Help us to feel the presence of our Lord in a very special way during our time together. Open up scripture to us. Let what we speak about become heart revelation. Let this time together in your word not leave us the same because it is impossible to spend time in your word and not be forever changed. So thank you Almighty One, for your hand upon our time together. This is your time to minister to us. We glorify you, Almighty Father. We glorify your name, Jesus, and we thank you, Holy Spirit, for making our Lord clear to us. We love you, God, and we worship you. Amen and amen. Amen. Well, please... Keep on letting me know where you are tuning in from. Mariki, you are most welcome. Georgiana, welcome. Welcome to everybody tuning in. So tonight, we are going to be diving into chapters 11 and 12 of my book, Why Christ Died. This is what the book looks like if you do not yet have your copy. Um, you can get it from Amazon. Um, 
from our shopping website in his name dot shop. If you are in South Africa, most Kum bookstores stock it as do exclusive books. You can also get it online from Take A Lot. So there are many different shops that you can get the book from. Amazon also has the Kindle version. So if you prefer eBooks, I myself am an old fashioned book lover. I like hard copies, but I know that those of you, especially who travel, appreciate eBooks. Often I get a book that is a hard copy and then I have to travel somewhere and I regret getting a hard copy. I regret not just being able to open the book on my iPad while I am on the plane. So whether you are a hard copy person or an ebook person, please make sure you get your copy so that you can read this book. And I know that this book will change your life. It changed my life writing it. I fell more in love with Jesus and I came to an even deeper understanding of who he is and what he achieved on the cross for us. And, you know, salvation for me is one of those doctrines and I suppose every doctrine is like this but salvation especially is one of those doctrines that you you just never plunge the depths of you know you keep on learning more and more about what Jesus achieved for us on the cross you keep on learning more and more about our salvation and and one never becomes satisfied and there are always depths to plunge there are always things that one can better understand new things that one can discover. I always liken our salvation to a multifaceted gem and you have all the different sides of this gem, you know, so many sides and you know, you keep on glimpsing salvation in a different way and every time you glimpse it from a different angle you are once again struck by its beauty and its pricelessness. And that is salvation, that is the message of the cross. So tonight we are going to look at chapters 11 and 12. Now, I titled this part of the book, Christ and His Cross. It is part three of the book. And I can't believe it, but this is actually our penultimate session together. Next week will be our last session. I think the next time I do a book club on this book, I am going to spread out the book club over many, many weeks. So we are not rushing through chapters, but we can really spend a lot of time in each chapter because there's so much to discuss, so many scriptures to unpack. Um, but yes, tonight we are just going to go through two chapters. These chapters are titled Pierced for Our Sakes and then Judging Jesus. These two chapters, gosh, the, the book really hinges on these two chapters because in these two chapters I spoke about Christ and his crucifixion, what he went through. And what the process of crucifixion entailed and I speak about what happened between the father and the son on the cross and that is that is a subject that one could write a whole book about just that subject and that subject alone and it is a very precious subject and we are going to speak about that tonight so I hope you have your book I hope you have your Bible and a pen and a paper or a computer or an iPad that you can use to take notes with. I will be sending out these notes to you again tomorrow. I've been sending out the notes from each session to those who sign up to the book club. So if you have not yet signed up, please sign up. You can bounce to our main website in his name .global. You will see a nice big banner there advertising the book club. Click on that banner and you will find a short little sign-up form. I just need your name and your email address and then you'll be added to that list. And to that list, I send out the notes from each session. So tomorrow I'll be sending out the notes from tonight's session. And those notes really consist of the primary points that I cover in each chapter. So really those notes consist of a summary of the chapters that I go through and those notes are really fantastic to refer back to um, when you go through the book again in the future or just to refer back to in your quiet time because those notes really highlight those pivotal truths that scripture teaches us regarding Christ and his cross. If you haven't signed up yet, make sure you sign up so you can be getting those notes in your inbox tomorrow. Okay, welcome to everybody else who has jumped on board. Michelle from the UK. 
from Swindon. Wonderful to see you, Michelle. I miss you and Swindon. Please give all my love to everybody there. Okay, let us start in chapter, chapter 11, titled Pierced for Our Sakes. Now, I still remember when I was in university and there was a, a small event promoted um, at a local community hall and it was a theologian who was coming to actually share about crucifixion and what, what those who were crucified actually had to endure. And it was all from a, a Christian perspective and I remember attending this lecture and leaving completely rattled because up until that point I never fully understood what Christ had to physically endure. He was crucified, we know he was nailed to a cross, but many of us, we spend our earthly lives not understanding what that, what that form of death actually entailed. And so I want to touch on this tonight, and I know it is not a very nice subject, and you do not find it preached in many churches, because it is not something that we like to think about, but it is something that we need to understand as believers. We need to understand what our Savior went through, not just spiritually, but physically, what he had to endure physically for us, because it really does deepen our love for him and it deepens our understanding of him being obedient to the law to the point of death even the death of the cross we understand what paul meant when he wrote that the death the death by crucifixion the death on the cross that jesus suffered was a horrific death indeed so i start off in this chapter and I speak about how the adjective excruciating in the English language actually finds its origin in a Latin word um, that actually means out of the cross. So that word excruciating that we have in English, it finds its origin in crucifixion. That death, that, that death by crucifixion was excruciating. It has excruciating in its very definition. So it was a form of death that was prolonged, that was agonizing, that that cannot be fully fathomed, the level of pain that people who died in that way actually were forced to endure. So we spoke in the last session about some of the other torments that our Jesus had to endure. We spoke about the scourging that he had to endure and we dived a little bit into that, the horrors of that scourging. So now I want to move on from that scourging and we read in scripture how Jesus then had to carry his cross to the place of the skull Golgotha where he was crucified. And I will start off by reading here in the Gospels, John 19, 17. And we read, they took Jesus therefore and he went out carrying his own cross to the place called the place of a skull which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. And then I will read as well from Luke chapter 23, verse 26. When they led him away, they seized a man, Simon of Cyrene, as he was coming in from the country and placed on him the cross to carry behind Jesus. Now, the cross, a physical cross in those days, consisted of two parts. You had the horizontal beam of the cross, which is known as the patibulum, and then you had the vertical beam, which was known as the stipe. So the stipe and the patibulum together formed the cross. Now, there is some disagreement amongst theological scholars where, whether Jesus was forced to carry the entire cross as a whole, the patibulum already having been attached to the stipe, or whether he was just required to carry the patibulum, so the horizontal bar. And we find if we look at artwork over the centuries of Jesus carrying his cross, we find different scenes being portrayed. Jesus carrying the entire cross, the patibulum already attached to the stipe, and then Christ just carrying the horizontal beam. And the reason why scholars disagree is because they're is 
various research when it comes to the weight of those two pieces of wood. So whether it was even possible for one person to actually carry the cross that had already been fully put together. But the fact is whether our Jesus was required to carry the patibulum and the stipe already attached together or just the patibulum, the fact is after the scourging, he was incredibly weak in incredible pain. He had lost a lot of blood and he was just not coping um, with the stress and the strain of that, of that job. And so this man, Simon, was then roped in, forced, so to speak, to help with the process. And what a privilege um, it was for him to assist the Christ. And this man, Simon, we read about a certain, a certain young man called Rufus in the book of Romans. Um, and, you know, a, a, a young man who's clearly a believer and many believe that this Rufus was actually the son of Simon. Um, so whether, whether Simon and Rufus were at that stage already followers of Jesus Christ or not, maybe this experience um, actually caused Simon um, to, to understand who this, this strange man was, you know, who some were screaming for his death, others were screaming for him to be spared, who this controversial figure was, we don't know, but the reality is Simon was roped in to help Christ carry his cross and it seems if he was not a believer then him and his family did come to salvation which is a wonderful thought. Um, so now coming to the hill of Golgotha, um, once either the full cross or its patibulum had been carried to the place of the crucifixion, in this instance, Golgotha. Then the next step was for the, the, the person being crucified to be attached to that structure. And, you know, history tells us that they were either attached with ropes or with nails or a combination of the two. Um, those nails um, were proper nails. They were spikes. Nails is actually the wrong word, spikes. Um, and I included measurements here in the book. So five to seven inches or 13 to 18 centimeters. Um, so these were, these were proper spikes. Um, these, weren't, these weren't small things. And we know that our Jesus was nailed. Perhaps he was secured with ropes as well, but we know for a fact that he was indeed nailed. Scripture is very clear with regards to this. We read in Psalm 22, verse 16, which is known as the Psalm of the Cross. Um, and we read here a prophecy regarding the Messiah, regarding what Jesus would experience. And we read here, dogs have surrounded me. A gang of evildoers has closed in on me. They pierced my hands and my feet. There we find the piercing. And then if we read in John 20, verse 25, here the disciple Thomas always called the doubting Thomas, but I don't think Thomas was given enough credit. Um, and we read here regarding him, the other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. So he said to them, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. So Jesus was nailed to the cross, his hands and his feet. Now, where were those nails placed? It is interesting that the Greek word for hand in scripture actually refers in Greek to not just the physical hand, but the hand and the wrist, actually even the entire forearm. So whether the spike pierced Jesus's hand, you know, so many paintings, etc., have you know, the, the, the nail pierced through his palms, those nails pierced through his palms, or whether those spikes were pierced through his wrists. Also something that theologians disagree on. Some argue that the, the hand of a man would not be able to, to handle the weight. You know, once the weight of that man dropped down upon the hands, the hands would just rip. And now, if a crucifixion victim was attached to the cross with ropes as well, then those maybe would secure the victim enough so that the hands would not rip. Uh, but many believe that the nails actually pierced the wrists, you know, here just below the wrist bones. Um, so piercing 
the, the nerve there which would have caused immense pain and, and this part of the body is actually amazingly strong and it would have been able to, to handle the weight, um, the body weight, you know, pulling down on it at that point. Um, now, if at that stage, once the, the person had been attached, you know, by the hands to the patibulum, to the horizontal beam, if the cross hadn't been fully put together yet, you know, then what would have happened is if it had been fully put together, then the stipe would have had to have been pushed into a hole that would already have been prepared. Um, and if the cross hadn't been put together, then the stipe generally would already have been fixed into the ground and the victim on the patibulum would have been hoisted up, you know, by means of ropes, manpower, the ladder, um, and then the patibulum would have been attached to the stipe. So we don't know what was the case in the case of our Lord, um, but I'm just filling you in on, on some of the logistics here. Um, then of course the feet of our Lord would have been attached likewise to the cross. And once again, there is some disagreement as to whether the, the, the spikes would have pierced the Achilles heel um, or whether they would have gone through the front of the feet. Um, there's some arguments when it comes to that. So the feet maybe were turned to the side and the Achilles tendon pierced um, or the feet were pushed straight against the cross and the knees bent and then the nails or nail pushed through the center of the feet. So some disagreements regarding that, but the reality is that regardless of where those nails penetrated, our Lord allowed himself to be pierced for our sakes. That is the most important point here. And I want to read in Mark chapter 15 verses 25 to 28. We read, now it was the third hour and they crucified him. And the inscription of his accusation was written above the king of the Jews. With him they also crucified two robbers, one on his right and the other on his left. So the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and he was numbered with the transgressors. So our Jesus hung on the cross for six hours when scripture speaks about the third hour. And um, we are talking about nine o'clock in the morning, the, the Jewish timekeeping you know, method um, of that day. It involved counting hours from sunrise, so from 6 a.m. So the third hour of the day, you would then count three hours from 6 a.m. So you're looking at 9 a.m. So our Jesus was attached to that cross 9 a.m. And we know that he died six hours later at 3 p.m. And three of those hours involved absolute darkness. And I will speak about those hours of darkness in a little bit, but not quite yet. Um, so let's go back to our Jesus having been attached to the cross. Now, once suspended, um, his full body would have then pulled down, you know, upon those spikes, you know, piercing his hands, piercing his wrists, which would have, of course, caused immense pain. His, his scourged back, which really would have just been a, a hunk of, you know, open flesh, and would have scraped you know, down the rough wood of the cross. Um, very likely, and um, what is very possible, is his shoulders would have dislocated. I mean, that was quite common with crucifixion victims because just that, that jerk, you know, being, being you know, erected upwards and then you know, jerked upwards and the full body pulling against those spikes would have often resulted in the dislocating of the shoulders and even the ripping of ligaments. Um, and actually, you know, have in mind here in Psalm 22, we read, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. Um, you know, just, just a, a horrible thought. Um, and, you know, the body of our Christ would have pushed down even further upon his nailed feet, you know, causing even more pain. Now, I want to speak a bit about the breathing process for crucifixion victims, and this is something that is, is very interesting and something that we need to understand to fully understand crucifixion. And I'm just going to read to you um, a portion from the book here, page 124, the last paragraph for those of you who are following along. And I wrote here, breathing is a twofold process, inhaling, breathing in, and exhaling, breathing out. 
when someone inhales the muscles separating the chest and abdominal cavities, the diaphragm contracts and moves downwards. This makes the chest cavity larger and air rushes into the lungs. Exhaling requires the diaphragm to relax and move upwards. So this reduces the size of the chest cavity and the air is expelled. In the case of someone enduring crucifixion, the process is complicated by the weight of the body pulling down on the arms and the diaphragm. This causes the chest cavity to enlarge and air to rush in, making inhalation or breathing in very easy. But what about the air getting out? The sufferer would have to push their body up against their feet or pull their body up using their arms, if not dislocated, in order to expel the air. The pain caused by doing this was intense, with the sufferer pushing down on impaled feet and scraping their scourged back against the rough wooden cross. So it's a horrible paragraph and I hated writing it, but you know, I want you to understand that you know, once Jesus had been crucified, once he was on that cross, every breath that he took involved suffering. And remember, he hung on that cross for six hours. Every breath, every breath involved effort. It involved pain. Now, the actual cause of death for victims of crucifixion varied because of the scourging process, which was a, 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 a common means of you know, preparing a victim for crucifixion. Because of the scourging, because of dehydration and exposure, blood loss, um, you know, many died just from shock and organ failure. Um, you know, the difficulty breathing um, could cause asphyxia, so suffocation, um, cardiac arrest, even cardiac rapture. Um, so in other words, the, the body was placed under tremendous stress, tremendous physical stress. And we know that to hasten the process, um, often the legs of the crucifixion victim were broken. And what this would result in is the victim could then no longer push themselves up on their legs in order to breathe out because their legs were broken and so then they couldn't breathe out and they would quickly suffocate. So this would be a way that the Romans could quicken the death of the crucifixion victims um, if they were dying fast enough and the process needed to be sped up. And we read this in scripture and I will read to you here from John chapter 19 verse 31 to 33. Um, since it was the preparation day, the Jews did not want the bodies to remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a special day. They requested that Pilate have the men's legs broken and that their bodies be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man and the other one who had been crucified with him. When they came to Jesus, they did not break his legs since they saw that he was already dead. And then in Mark 15, verse 44 and 45, we read, Pilate was surprised to hear that he had already died. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. Now, I want to spend a little bit of time on this um, because you know this, this passage makes it clear that Jesus died remarkably quickly. Um, you know, Pilate was surprised to hear how quickly he died and this was Pilate, this was a Roman governor, you know, crucifixion was part of his, you know, his, his daily job or his daily experience, so to speak, I mean, crucifying, you know, criminals. Um, that was common, you know, across the Roman Empire. So Pilate would have been incredibly familiar with crucifixion and how quickly those who were crucified would genuinely die. So he was surprised that Jesus had died so quickly. Um, now, I want to read about that moment of death because it really tells us a lot um, about what was going on in that moment. And I want to read here a couple of verses and then we'll speak about it. John 19, verse 13. Um, after Jesus had taken the vinegar, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and he died. In John 10, verse 17 to 18. Um, my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my father. That's something that Jesus spoke 
uh, before his crucifixion. And then in Matthew 27 verse 50, Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Now, the Greek verb that we find there for yielded up, uh, it's the Greek word, verb, um, afiami. Now, afiami speaks about letting go, releasing, sending away. Um, it can even mean forgiveness. Um, you know, to, you basically are releasing somebody's debt. Um, and it speaks about the person doing the releasing being in absolute control. Somebody releases something, lets something go. So it's very interesting that this word is used in scripture when it speaks about Jesus giving up his life, you know, letting his spirit leave his body. And, you know, we think about that statement that I read um, from John 10, you know, where Jesus makes that declaration and he says, you know, I have the power to lay my life down and I have the power to take it back up again. You know, so the reality is in that moment that Jesus yielded up his spirit, gave up his spirit, he was in complete control of that situation. Um, you know, the task that had been assigned to him by his father had been achieved and the moment had come for him to pay that one massive death penalty. Um, and I'm going to speak about this in the next chapter, but the Father had laid on him all the sins of all the world, had judged him in our place. Each one of those sins came with its own attached death penalty. And the time had come now for Jesus to die for the sins of the world, to pay that death penalty for us all. And so he, he had one last, one last task to accomplish in this great salvation plan, he was to give up his life. He was to surrender it all. He was to die. And so he gave up his spirit. It was a choice. It was a decision. You know, it, Jesus didn't die from blood loss or from suffocation. He didn't die gasping for one last breath. He didn't you know, become unconscious because of blood loss and just drift away. But he died with decision. He died with purpose. He died with intent. He released his spirit into his father's hands. And, you know, this, you know, the, this, this theory, if we want to call it that, or what I'm saying, it, it's very much backed up to what the centurion says, who was responsible for overseeing Christ's crucifixion. And, you know, we read in Mark chapter 15, verse 39, you know, and the centurion makes a statement and he has observed, you know, he was responsible for Christ's crucifixion and he has been observing Jesus, you know, for these six hours. And the way that Jesus died was unlike any death, any death by crucifixion he had ever seen. And it astounded him so much that he made the statement and he said, truly this man was the son of God. And, you know, why would the centurion say something like this? You know, what was so astounding about Jesus? You know, as far as we know, um, he wasn't that familiar with Jesus up until this point. Maybe he was familiar. If he was a centurion that had been based, you know, in Jerusalem for an extended period, he would have definitely have known of Jesus. You know, this prophet of the Jews who was deemed to be a miracle performer and, you know, who was causing a lot of controversy, you know, among the Jewish people. But, you know, maybe he didn't have any knowledge of Jesus. Maybe he had just been assigned to Jerusalem. We don't know. But it was the way that Christ died that caught his attention. And the fact is that the centurion, he had, gosh, probably overseen hundreds of crucifixions. And he had seeing crucifixion victims really die in one of two ways, either because of the blood loss, because of the dehydration, the exposure, they had just drifted away into unconsciousness and then slipped away, um, or they had died really unable to breathe, you know, gasping, you know, to, to, to push the air out of their lungs, you know, one more time, dying, panicked, um, petrified. Um, you know, knowing they're just about to drift away into an uncertain eternity and doing their best to hang on to life, regardless of how agonizing that life had become. So this was how crucifixion victims usually died. But here yeah, this man died with strength. He had the strength to still cry out, you know, 
it is finished. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And, you know, that, that vocalization, the Bible's very clear that Jesus cried out with a loud voice. Um, so he mustered up the energy. He had enough strength left in his body. Um, you know, speaking involves, you know, pushing air out of our lungs. You know, so speaking would have been agonizing on the cross. And yet Jesus had the strength um, to cry out with a loud voice. He had the, 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 the mental state, um, the togetherness, you know, to put together lucid sentences. You know, this wasn't a man who was slipping away. This wasn't a man um, who was panicked. This was a man in complete control. And he gave up his spirit as if by decision, as if by choice at a moment an ordainly, supremely, supernaturally defined moment. And this caught the centurion's attention. And we can only pray um, that when the disciples started preaching the gospel, um, he heard and he gave his life to the Lord. And maybe we can meet him one day, that centurion who stood at the foot of the cross. Um, what an incredible testimony. Um, that would be to be the one overseeing the Christ's crucifixion and then falling on one's knees and repenting of one's sins and accepting his sacrifice for one's own sins. How, how extraordinary. So this is what I'm saying now, Jesus dying with decision, dying with intent. Um, I want to now backtrack a little bit and look at spiritually what Jesus was going through. So we spoke a little bit about now what he went through physically and um, the ordeal of the cross but spiritually and um, what he was going through and you know I wish I could dive into this a lot more but please read the chapter in the book um, I'm really just touching on on points that I deem are pivotal um, so let's move on to chapter 12 judging Jesus judging Jesus you know and that um, that title for that chapter, Judging Jesus, I, it, um, you know, whenever I, I say it, I'm always, you know, struck with such reverence and holy awe. You know, the fact that Jesus allowed himself to be judged in our place, that the Father judged his Son um, when he should be keeping all that judgment for us, you know, those who deserve the judgment, but he didn't. He poured it all out upon our Jesus. And I want to start off this chapter by reading the first paragraph. And we read here, um, and I'm reading from page 129, those of you who are following along in the book. Um, Jesus hung on his cross from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And what took place in the invisible realm during those six hours goes beyond all earthly understanding. Our minds cannot comprehend it. Our hearts sense the intensity of it, but struggle to process it. Yet we must make our most vehement attempt to grasp the ungraspable with the help of his spirit within us and his scripture before us. In the text that follows, we are going to consider what transpired between God the Father and God the Son during this period. These dynamics are most holy and we will tread most lightly. And then I want to carry on to page 130. Um, and I write here, uh, halfway down the page, I say, we know that the power of the animal sacrifice, and we spoke a lot about animal sacrifices in the previous two sessions, um, they and what it symbolized. However, as soon as Christ was lifted up on his cross, all symbolism screeched to a sudden halt. Things became very real. The foreshadowing had reached a tipping point. The Lamb of Lambs, the Son of Man, was about to do his work. Um, we spoke a lot in session one and session two about how the animal sacrifices of the Old Testament foreshadowed the Christ, how they only had power because Jesus would come and do the work. His blood would be shed, the kind of blood that can wash away sin, not just cover sin, but fully wash it away. So now all that symbolism screeched to a halt. All that symbolism was coming to an end because the one, the one who everyone was waiting for, um, that creation itself was waiting for, um, he had arrived on the scene and the time had come um, for him to pay the debt, for him to be judged for the sins of the world. Um, and I want to read a verse here from Isaiah 53, and I, I absolutely love 53. It, it's one of my most favorite chapters 
in the whole Bible and whenever I whenever I just need to love Jesus I always I always retreat to that chapter and I just read it very slowly and I just dwell on it um, it's an exquisite chapter and I'm reading here from verse 6 of Isaiah 53 all we like sheep have gone astray we have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all so I want to pull out of this verse that statement the Lord the Lord has laid on him the Lord laid on Christ the iniquity of us all so it was not mankind that laid iniquity upon the Christ it was God who lay all of our sins upon Christ and you know I can imagine God you know carefully combing through the lives of everybody who had lived everybody who was living and would still live and you know picking out every sin both the minuscule and the major and putting those upon the Christ together with all those attached death penalties remember we have spoken about in previous sessions how every sin comes with its own death penalty attached with its own death penalty judgment attached to it because all sin is deserving of death so here God takes all of those sins and the death penalties attached to all of those sins and lays that load upon the Christ now we know from scripture that darkness covered the earth for three hours immediately prior to Christ's death on the cross and and the, the Gospels Matthew Luke and Mark all refer to this and I will read from Luke 23 verse 44 and 46 and we read here it was now only midday the whole world became dark for three hours as the light of the sun faded away then Jesus cried out with a loud voice father I surrender my spirit into your hands and he took his last breath and he died and you know for me it was during this time during these these three hours of darkness that God laid all of the sins of the world upon Christ it was as if the sun in the sky could not bear to shine anymore you know while the son of god was actively shrouded you know in a cloak of darkness and shame um, nature was recoiling um, you know at what was going on you know the light of life um, was taking upon himself all of our darkness all of our trespasses all of our perversions you know everything was holding its breath as this this was taking place as these three hours you know were were transpiring and um, and what you know when I speak about God putting our sins upon Jesus you know what, what do what do I mean by that I um, you know we spoke in the last session about how you know Christ bearing our sins mean that he means that he took responsibility for our sins he became liable for our sins so I want to jump into that concept of liability a little bit more and there's a term called vicarious liability vicarious liability for those of you who are lawyers out there or maybe have studied law and um, you'll be familiar with the term it might go under another term in other countries but in South Africa at least and I'm sure British law because British law and South African law um, have many similarities but we call it vicarious liability and it's a legal term that speaks about one party taking responsibility for another party because of the relationship that exists between those two parties and it's the relationship of superior and subordinate so it's a superior taking responsibility for the actions of a subordinate and those actions need to be authorized authorized actions but actions that are committed in an unauthorized way so what do I mean by this the, the best way would be to give you an example um, so a common superior subordinate example is that of boss and employee um, so let's take for example a delivery driver um, so let's us name our delivery driver we will name our delivery driver free and so Freddie is doing his job so he is fulfilling an authorized act um, his boss has employed him to be a delivery driver and he is making a delivery so his act is fully authorized but 
Freddie drives recklessly. So he is going about the authorized act, but he is doing so in an unauthorized manner. He is speeding, he is all over the place, he's crossing on a solid white line, you know, he's driving in the emergency lane, disaster. And in the process of driving recklessly, you know, Freddie crashes into the back of hmm, Mrs. Komalo's brand new BMW Cabriolet in cherry red. And Mrs. Komalo is seriously unimpressed with Freddie's reckless driving skills. And she holds Freddie's boss accountable um, for the accident. And she sues Freddie's boss and he needs to pay out. So she holds him liable. Um, for Freddie's unlawful behavior. And, and this is, you know, perfectly legal. And, you know, the boss has to step in and he has to be, he has to be accountable, you know, for what Freddie did. Freddie is an employee. He was going about his deliveries as he should, but unfortunately he did not do so in an authorized way. And now the boss has to step up to the plate and yes, do damage control. Um, so this is really the concept of vicarious liability. And I still remember when we were being taught this in law class and, you know, as the lecture was going through the concept, I was sitting there thinking to myself, gosh, this sounds a lot, what Jesus, a lot like what Jesus actually did for us. And then what do I mean by that? You know, our relationship with God is a lot more intimate than boss and employee, but it is the relationship of a superior and a subordinate. He is our creator. He made us. Um, you know, the very breath in our lungs is a gift from him. He created an earth, you know, um, you know he, an environment in which we could live. Uh, we are living, that is something authorized by him, but we are living in an unauthorized way. We are sinning and we are behaving in a way that is not pleasing to him. Um, so we are acting in an unauthorized way and he is our superior. Um, basically is basically is being held liable um, for the wrongdoings that we have done. Um, we can also take it from this angle. In my example of the boss and Freddie, um, the boss can be held accountable for Freddie's deeds because they are part of the same company, they're part of the same entity. You know, that, that being at this part of the same company connects them. Um, now think about Jesus. Um, you know, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, they all created us together. You know, they are all our creator together. Um, but, you know, they are not only our creator, but Christ became part of our company. He became one of us. He became a human being, part of our company, part of the company of mankind. So he could be held liable for the transgressions, for the wrongdoings of mankind. Um, and this is just such a such a remarkable concept. So here you have God the Son stepping up to the plate um, as our creator. You know, we, we read in the, the Gospel of John chapter 1, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Um, he was beginning in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. So, you know, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they all created us. So Jesus is our creator. Here he takes responsibility responsibility for us um, and he becomes part of our company to you know to further solidify this link that he has with us he becomes part of the company of mankind so he can he can assume liability for the wrongdoings of mankind so God the Father can hold him liable for the wrongdoings of mankind so absolutely an incredible concept and you know, uh, those of you, I apologize if I'm becoming, you know, too, too legalistic in the way I'm picturing this. But, you know, this to me makes a lot of sense, um, you know, and take your time going through this concept in the book. But, you know, it, 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 makes, it makes the gospel message um, quite logical, you know, so to speak. Here, God, our superior, was taking responsibility for us. He is our creator. Um, and he had to step up to the plate and basically fix our mess because we weren't in any position to fix our mess ourselves. Um, and I want to read here a, a passage from Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. Um, and we read here, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, speaking about Jesus, that through death 
He might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death through all their lifetimes subject to bondage. So here we have it emphasized how Christ, you know, partook in flesh and blood. He became one of us, part of our company, so he could be held liable for our wrongdoings. And, you know, this God, the Son becoming the Son of Man, God, the Son becoming flesh. Um, it, I mean, that's a remarkable concept all by itself. You know, he had to, he had to swap out, he had to swap out omniscience, you know, for the limitations of the human mind. He had to, you know, swap out being omnipresent, you know, to the limitations of human body. He had to swap out omnipotence, um, you know, to being fully reliant on the Father and the Son. He fully emptied himself, emptied himself, so that he could become one of us. Um, you know, that just, just an extraordinary show of love. And I, I love how in scripture, you know, Jesus is described as the Lamb of God. And, you know, I was meditating on it one day and it, and it really touched me because I thought to myself, you know, why is Jesus called the Lamb of God? You know, we, we know that sheep, you know, were one of the animal types that were deemed to be a, a clean type of animal to sacrifice on the altar. But there were also other animals that were, you know, allowed to be sacrificed. They were deemed clean. They were deemed suitable, um, you know, but cattle, um, you know, doves, uh, you know, you have all these different types of animals, goats, um, you know, so, so, so why, why, do, why does scripture compare Christ to a lamb? Why, he is, why is he called the lamb of God, the lamb of God? And, you know, then you think back to that verse from Isaiah 53 that we read, how all we like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way. And yet the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You know, scripture compares us to sheep so often. And um, think of Luke 15, where Jesus is telling the story of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. He compares us to sheep, you know, to us as sinners going astray to sheep. You know, even in our everyday language, you know, in modern day English, we would speak about someone being the black sheep of the family. You know, if they, you know, the, kind of the odd one out in the family, you know, the one who is always different, you know, to everybody else, whether in a good way or whether in a bad way, often in a bad way if we're speaking about the black sheep. But, you know, so often in scripture and just in, you know, cultures, um, you know, people are compared to sheep. If you say somebody just follows and doesn't think for themselves, we say, oh, you know, he's like a sheep, you know, he just follows, doesn't think. Um, so it, it's just it's just beautiful how Jesus is called the Lamb, the Lamb of God, because it just emphasizes the fact that the shepherd of the sheep became a sheep himself. You know, he became one of us, so he could become the savior of us all. And, you know, that's something beautiful to meditate on. Um, okay, moving on. I want to speak about something here called judicial separation, um, and then spend a little bit of time on this and then we'll bring the session to an end. Um, judicial separation, this is a, an interesting concept, but a very important concept because it speaks about what took place between the Father and the Son on the cross um, during the crucifixion process, specifically during those three hours when God the Father laid our sins upon the Son and held him liable for our trespasses. And, you know, I've heard messages preached on this. I have heard ministers speak about, you know, how God turned his back on Christ. Um, and, you know, there was a, a, a spiritual separation. Christ died spiritually. You know, he became sin. Um, and I don't, I don't, you know, fully agree with this. And I'll explain what I believe scripture teaches us. And it, it's, it's, it's really quite beautiful and quite simple. It makes a lot of sense. Um, so I want to start reading here um, at the beginning of the section called Judicial Separation on page 135. Um, and I wrote here, For those three hours of horror and darkness, God the Father and God the Son, for the first and only time in all eternity, were not judge and judge, but rather judge and accused. They stood not side by side, but face to face. Jesus stood vicariously liable for humanity and God laid him, sorry, God held him responsible for our sins. As our sins were laid upon Christ, I hear the words of the Father echoing across heaven. 
you will bear their guilt, you will be executed in their place. We must remember, however, that Jesus never stopped being the Word made flesh. He remained divine. He remained God. Yet somehow, and this is a great mystery, God the Father stepped away from God the Son and judged him in our stead. There was a judicial separation, but still, at the same time, they remained one. Now, you know, this is a, this is a difficult concept to grasp because Jesus and God, you know, as I said here, they, thankfully for the first and only time in all eternity, and it will never happen again, they were not judge and judge, standing side by side, but they became judge, God the Father, and the accused, God the Son. Um, so there was a separation, a judicial separation, um, but still they remained one. We must remember that simultaneously God was in Christ, reconciling the world back to himself. So it sounds like a bit of a paradox that they were judicially separated, but still they remained one. But we must remember that these are deep spiritual things and it's very difficult for us to grasp them. And so we will do our best to understand. Um, but, you know, scripture back this, backs this up in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18 to 19, we read, Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their wrongdoings against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So here, God was in Christ, reconciling the world back to himself, while at the same time, he was standing as judge, judging Christ for our wrongdoings. We read in John 16, verse 32, and this is such a pivotal scripture. This is Jesus speaking, and he says to his disciples, he says, indeed, the hour is coming, yes, has now come, that you will be scattered, each to his own, and will leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. The Father is with me. So at all times, the Father was with Christ, reconciling the world back to himself, but at the same time, standing outside of Christ, judging Christ in our stead something to meditate on for quite a while. So the Son and the Father, they had the same vision, the same purpose. This was a plan that they had agreed upon. Death would meet its end. Sin would meet its end in the body of the Christ. Um, there's a pas passage in Colossians chapter 2 that I want to read to you. And, you know, this also really emphasizes the fact that it was God and Christ together as a team um, who were making the salvation plan happen. Um, and, you know, we read here, um, and I'm going to, you know, whenever I, I read a pronoun, I'm going to say whether it refers to Jesus or whether it refers, refers to God. Um, so in him, Jesus, you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, by pushing off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him, Jesus, in baptism, in which you also raised with Jesus through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he, God, has made alive together with Jesus, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he, God, has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers. He, God, made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Um, now that final sentence in the passage, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them, triumphing over them in it. In some Bible translations, this has been allocated to Jesus, and it wouldn't be wrong because this was Christ's victory, but if you look at the Greek, um, it actually makes a lot more sense, you know, this sentence being assigned to God the Father. Um, and actually, in a, a scripture translation called God's Word Translation, um, it says it this way, um, speaking about God the Father, he stripped the rulers and authorities of their power and made a public spectacle of them as he celebrated his victory in Christ. So we must remember this was the victory of the Father and the Son together as a team. They were accomplishing the salvation plan. And this is something really that we must, we must remember. Um, it was a team effort. 
um, they had agreed on it together and they were achieving it together. They had different roles in the plan. God was the judge, Jesus was the accused, but it was a team effort. Um, in Matthew 27, verse 45 to 46, we read, Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So a forsaking was taking place. This was the judicial separation that we were speaking about. God the Father laid all the sins of the world upon Jesus with the assigned death penalties, and he was judging Jesus guilty for all of those sins in our place. Um, so this was the forsaking that was taking place. And it must have been an incredible difficult thing for the father to do because, you know, I'm sure he wanted to rush in and intervene. He wanted to rush in and help, um, rush in and, and share in the agony, but he could not. They had to stick to their allocated roles. Um, and those words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, those words are so deep with meaning. You know, because they communicate both distance and intimacy, both the distance, the judicial separation that was taking place, but at the same time, the intimacy that Christ was in God and God was in Christ, reconciling the world back to himself. You know, that my God, my God, that is less intimate than, you know, the usual address, my father, you know, Christ would always refer to God as his father. Here he just calls him my God. So there we have a sign of distance, judicial separation, God, the judge, the creator, and the almighty one, Christ taking the position of the accused, the one being judged for the sins of the world. Um, you know, the forsaking, why have you forsaken me, the judicial separation, but there's also a lot of intimacy because the reality is that Christ prayed. He still prayed. So the line of communication had not been broken. There was the intimacy. They were still one achieving this plan together. Um, I spoke before how speaking from the cross would have been no easy feat. You know, to speak requires exhaling. Um, you know, air is pushed over the vocal cords. And I explained earlier how exhaling would have required such pain, you know, having to, to push oneself up off one's feet, to force the air out of one's lungs, to pull oneself up by one's arms if one's shoulders weren't dislocated, scraping one's raw back against that wood. Um, so this was no easy feat to speak. Um, you know, I, I speak here in the book about the Psalm of the Cross, and that's really a Psalm, Psalm 22, that I encourage you to read in your spare time and, and really meditate on that Psalm because, you know, that, that line, um, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That is the first line of that psalm. And that's the most incredible psalm because, you know, it starts off from a position of defeat, but then it, 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 then it goes to victory um, and it goes to consolation. Um, it's, it's, it's really an absolutely stunning psalm. Um, you know, and I wrote here in the book a couple of verses, um, you know, so while it starts, you know, with this, sense of desolation and quickly reverts to hope and we read that you are enthroned as the holy one you are the one israel praises and you our ancestors put their trust they trusted in you and you delivered them to you they cried and they were not and they were not they were not shamed they were saved and you they trusted absolutely stunning words and and this hope thing you know this hope is made so plain in those final words of our savior you know, on the cross. We know that he cried out, it's finished, and we know that he cried out and said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And there we have this return of this intimate term, Father. Um, you know, he, he knew he was, he was entrusting his spirit to one who would know that he himself was guiltless. Yes, he was bearing the sins of all the world. God was judging him in our place but he himself was guiltless. God the Father would find his spirit, his own spirit, guiltless. Um, you know, in Romans 8.3, we read, For what the law could not do, weak as it was to the flesh, God did, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. Now, I find it very interesting how Scripture speaks about condemning sin 
not condemning Christ. God did not condemn Christ. He condemned sin in the person of Christ. Christ at all times was the guiltless one, the spotless lamb. Um, never did he ever cease being the holy one, the word of God, the word made flesh, God the son, the son of God. He was at all times perfect, but he was being held liable for our sins, for our trespasses. And I spoke about this in the last session, the, the guiltlessness of the son of God and how this is such an important concept for us to grasp that Christ from the beginning of his life to him giving himself up for us on the cross at all times remained utterly and completely guiltless. Um, Hebrews 5, 7 is pivotal here. Um, and we read, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. Now this is an interesting verse because Jesus was not saved from physical death. He died. He had to die. His, his flesh was the offering that he needed to give for the salvation of the entire world. So what kind of death is scripture speaking about here? Scripture is speaking about spiritual death. Um, you know, Jesus being damned to hell for all of eternity, spiritually separated from God the Father. And this was not Jesus' fate. Why? Because he himself had no sin. If there was sin in Jesus, his death would have achieved absolutely nothing. Um, he would have been condemned to hell for all of eternity. Um, his death would not have achieved the salvation of this world, but his own spirit was utterly guiltless. Um, and so this was the death that he was saved from. He was not spiritually separated from God. He did not die spiritually. Um, his spirit certainly was not condemned to hell for any period of time. Um, he was wholly saved from that fact. Um, he and God at all times remained one. Yes, he was held liable for our sins. Yes, God judged him in our place. Um, but he always remained the spotless sinless one. This is something very important that we must understand. Now, when the moment came and he gave up, released his spirit into the hands of God, and we, we've spoken about how that was a moment of control, how, you know, God had laid all our sins upon Jesus um, and their, you know, death penalties. God had now judged Jesus in our place. He was to pay up one mammoth death penalty for us all and the time had come for him to die and he cried out father into your hands i commit my spirit and he breathed his last he died and we read in scripture how the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and this is such a beautiful picture now that veil um, was nearly 60 feet high that's 18 meters and about four inches thick about 10 centimeters thick so this had to be a divine feat and this for me was God's amen. You know, it is amen to Christ's, it is finished. You know, saying yes, yes, you know, it has, it has been done, it is finished. Um, you know, you have been held liable for their sins. You have been judged in their place. Anybody who receives you will no longer be separated from us. There is no longer any separation between us and those who believe in your matchless name. This was God's amen, his divine declaration. Um, absolutely, absolutely stunning. Um, you know, the, the word propitiation is something that I also just want to touch on here quickly. Um, it's an interesting word and one that not many people understand. Um, in 1 John 14, we read, and this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins, propitiation. Now, what does that word propitiation mean? It sounds, it's very complicated, but it's actually quite simple. It's not a well-known term in our day and age, but it was a very well-known term in the age that Jesus would have lived in and the disciples would have lived in um, because of the pagan world that they were living in. And propitiation was really the concept that a wrathful deity could be appeased you know, through the bringing of gifts, um, the, the, the showing of goodwill, it was the appeasing of a wrathful deity. So it was really a form of bribery. Um, and, you know, here John uses this term, 
when it speaks about what happened on the cross between the Father and the Son. So in other words, Christ's act appeased the wrath of God. Now, I'm not saying that God was, you know, huffing and puffing, pacing in the throne room, hating mankind, and, you know, Jesus came and said, no, please, 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 you know, I'll be the lamb, I'll pay the price. Um, no, it wasn't like that at all. You know, God is the judge of the heavens and the earth, obligated to judge sin, and we spoke quite a bit about this in the first session. Um, so his judgment had to be appeased. Um, he could not be righteous judge and, you know, merciful savior without somebody stepping up to the plate um, and being held liable for the wrongdoing of mankind. Um, so this word propitiation speaks about, you know, God judging Jesus in our place, Jesus absorbing the judgment that was meant for us, which is exactly what took place. And I want to end off here just really emphasizing how we need to understand that the, the act of the cross wasn't just a sign of Christ's love for us. Um, it was equally a sign of God's love for us. You know, throughout scripture, there is so much emphasis on the love that God has for us. If you think about John 3, 16, you know, the famous scripture, one of the scriptures that we learn first in children's church, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, the emphasis there is on the love that God has for us. Um, you know, in, in 1 John 4, 14 that we just read, you know, the verse that includes that word propitiation, um, you know, it says there, and this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. So there we have the emphasis on the love of God. Um, you know, in Ephesians 2, verse 45, but God was rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. So often we focus on the love that Jesus has for us because of what he had to endure on the cross, but we must understand that the love that the Father has for us is just as vehement it is just as focused, it is just as intense. And you know, it was the Father and the Son driven by the united love for us that achieved the salvation plan. So you know, never forget that it wasn't just Jesus loving you that drove him to the cross, but it was the Father loving you and their love for you is equal. They could not love you more even if they tried. And I want to you know, finish off here, the last chap the last paragraph of page 142. Um, and I wrote here, the wrath of the Father is towards our sin, and that wrath is a righteous wrath. It is the wrath of light against darkness, holiness against depravity. It is the burden that rests on the judge of the heavens and the earth, a burden we have already discussed. God must annihilate the wickedness that permeates, infects, and destroys. The demands of justice must be met and they were met in the sacrifice of Jesus. Hallelujah and amen. So I hope you were blessed. Those are two potent chapters uh, packed with, with things to really meditate on. Um, and I encourage you to reread those chapters and really just spend time on loving the Father and loving the Son um, because yes, what they achieved for us we cannot say thank you enough. Um, now, in the next session, um, so now next week will be our last session together, can you believe it? Um, and I really wish I had allocated more time to this book club because they, gosh, I mean, to, to, we are speeding through these chapters, uh, but at the end of the day, you have the book, so you can take your time going through the book. Uh, but in the next session, I'm going to discuss part four of the book. And I titled this part from Hades to Heaven, so I'm going to speak about Hades, what is Hades, where Jesus went when he died, um, and his ascension. Um, so these are very important topics because there you know, is a lot of disagreements when it comes to where Jesus actually went when he died. You know, and I've you know, heard many different sermons preached on it. And at the end of the day, you know, scripture doesn't give us that much information, but it does give us some clues. Um, so I'm going to chat about what scripture says so that we can you know, reach a, a conclusion that is scripture based and makes sense you know, when we look at the salvation plan as a whole. So please do not miss next week, um, same time, same place, um, and we are going to carry on going through why Christ died. 
Um, but yes, please, if you have any questions, you've all been so quiet when it comes to questions, I don't mind. Um, it means I can motor through the chapters um, and not get distracted. But please, you are most welcome to email info at innersname.global with any questions that you may have. And I will do my best to get to them. And yes, watch your inbox tomorrow, those of you who have signed up for the book club, so that I can send you the notes um, from these two chapters. And if you haven't yet signed up, please go to innersame.global. Um, click on the banner that says book club and sign up officially to the book club so that I can send you those notes. Um, but yes, know that I love you very much. I'm praying for you. Um, I really, I really want you to grow more in your walk with Jesus. Even those of you who are already so intimate with him, there is, there is no, no, not a, not a hair, you know, between you, um, you know, Whenever we think we are close to our Jesus, we can always get closer still. Um, so the more we get to learn about him, you know, the, 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 the easier it is to love him and the more we can love him because we can appreciate him and all that he achieved for us. So let me pray for you and then we will call it a night. Oh, precious Jesus, I thank you for all of my wonderful friends all over the world, Lord, your sons, your daughters. And those who are already so in love with you and I ask that you would help them grow in their knowledge of you Lord give them head knowledge and heart knowledge Lord let every word that I spoke tonight let it sink deep within their hearts let it become heart revelation unpack Lord these two chapters further to them still let them truly understand what happened between you and your father on the cross what took place God, that you were in Christ, reconciling the world back to yourself. That Jesus, you became liable for our sins. You were judged in our place. You became the accused for us. You became very curiously liable for us. We are so grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lord, I pray a blessing upon all of my dear friends. I pray for your protection. No weapon formed against them will prosper. I pray for their physical health. I pray that they are strong in their bodies and their minds. In the name of Jesus, I pray for perfect healing. No disease can touch them. No, no sickness can come near their bodies, neither them nor their family members, my precious Jesus. I pray for breakthrough this week. You know the challenges they are facing. You know the breakthroughs that they so desperately need. Lord, bring those breakthroughs. Let rivers flow in the desert, streams in the wilderness. Make a way where there seems to be no way. So Lord, we love you. Until next time, keep us safe. Amen and amen. Amen. Until next week, Tuesday. I love you. Thank you so much for joining and I will see you soon. Bye-bye.